Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. So this event is brought to you by Data Talks Club, which is a community of people who love data. And this is a weekly event. Uh, we have two weekly events. Uh, uh, one is a webinar, uh, something we have uh, right now, where we have a presentation and then a Q&A at the end. And other one we have on Friday, which is more like a live podcast when we talk without slides. So you can check the events we have uh, in the uh, we, we planned on this link, datatalks club uh, slash events. And then you can see all the events we have in the pipeline and you can register on some of them. So for example, on Friday, we will talk about data observability. I think it's somehow a related concept, uh, maybe not necessarily the data mesh, but uh, this whole data engineering thing. So yeah, definitely check this out. And then to stay up to date with all our events, uh, oops, um, you can subscribe to our newsletter, join our Slack, and also subscribe to our YouTube uh, channel. And last but not least, uh, during our conversation today, you can ask any question you want. There is a pinned link in the live chat. So just click on this link and ask any question. And uh, if you see that your question was already asked, uh, you can upload this question. And then at the end, we will have uh, the time for Q&A and we will go from the most uploaded questions. And uh, that's all. And uh, Max, uh, the floor is yours. And thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Uh, let me quickly share my screen so that we can start getting on that side. Can you see my screen now? Is everything yes. working fine with the sharing? That's perfect. So yeah, thanks again uh, once more, Alexei, for having me today. Uh, I'm super excited to be here and to talk to you about uh, data mesh in practice or how to set up a data-driven organization. Um, what I have uh, planned for you for today is to take you a little bit on a journey on the one hand side to introduce the data mesh topic in general, but also to showcase how a typical journey that a company is going through when it comes to adopting um, towards uh, the, the ideas behind the data mesh uh, can look like what are common pitfalls that, uh, that we already identified over the time, but also what are like some, some, uh, some nice tips and tricks and some best practices on how to actually um, yep, get over those. Um, before I get going, uh, let me just uh, quickly give you a short intro about myself. So I'm Max, I'm a data engineering manager at Zalando, uh, Europe's biggest online platform for fashion. And I've been with the company for about five years now. And uh, during that time, mostly working on setting up uh, distributed data storage, setting up distributed compute engines, um, as well as a lot of services and tooling around that. And uh, by now I am leading the team that is responsible for uh, essentially the storage layer of the data lake of the company. And that's also what brought me into the position that for the first time I started thinking about some approaches that go beyond centralization go beyond things like the data lake. And that's also why over the last one to two years, I started um, looking a lot into the idea of the data mesh. And I also became very vocal uh, when it comes to talking about these ideas in public. So uh, eventually I also started calling myself a data mesh advocate, um, um, which I'm doing uh, through like giving talks like these to you folks uh, so that I can spread the word, uh, so to speak. I've been speaking uh, at a couple of uh, bigger conferences like uh, Data AI Summit, like Spark AI Summit. Um, and I am also giving some trainings on the O'Reilly page uh, if you want to dive deeper into the topic. Um, later on, I will drop you some, some links to that as well. Uh, the next one is happening in uh, almost uh, two weeks. So if you want to still sign up for that, I think there's still around uh, 50 slots uh, left when it comes to that. Personally, I'm a huge gamer. Uh, I love gaming. I love uh, any type of games, be it digital, uh, be it like physical board games, card games, anything. Currently, I, I'm dunking lots of hours into a game called Satisfactory, amazing game where you build like factory production pipelines uh, on a foreign planet. Can absolutely recommend that. Um, but most importantly, I also spent the majority of my of the last decade, I would always say, playing Magic the Gathering. Uh, I've been actually traveling a lot uh, throughout Europe and even beyond that to participate in tournaments uh, until the point uh, when I actually started stepping down a bit. But I still love to call myself a retired semi-professional Magic the Gathering player. If you later on have any question on that or you just want to chat and follow up on that, I'm absolutely there uh, to, to uh, go into this area as well. 
Enough about me. Um, so what I have planned for you today is uh, to, of course, uh, look a bit uh, into, into data mesh and practice. Data mesh and practice, of course, comes with some theory as well um, to uh, exactly speak against uh, what the title originally says. So at first, I will give you a little bit of an introduction of the data mesh itself uh, and where we are originally coming from. But then I want to take you on the journey um, and like some of the bigger I would say steps that we identified when talking to, to, to uh, various different people. Um, over the last couple of weeks and months, I've been talking to, to many uh, people from many companies to also get experiences from, from different journeys that, uh, that different companies and different people are on and combine this with my own experience um, to understand what are like these, these common pitfalls, but also these, these best practices uh, when it comes to really uh, starting a data mesh journey. And last but not least, as Alexei already mentioned, uh, we will have some, some Q&A as well, where you will get the chance uh, through Slido to, to ask some questions um, that uh, hopefully uh, I can answer the ones that are uh, most important for the group of you. Starting with the introduction, um, of course, uh, we need to like, the first thing we need to do is to take a step back and understand where we are actually coming from. And the interesting thing is that throughout the last, uh, yeah, 10 years mostly, but uh, for one half of that also much before, there has been two big approaches when it comes to working with data on an organizational scale. And that is um, the data warehouse and the data lake. And the interesting part is that even though the technologies behind them dramatically shifted and changed over the time, and especially over the last 10 years, if you zoom out to like quite a far distance, you will actually see that both these approaches have some very common patterns uh, and when thinking a bit uh, deeper about them also some very common flaws um, that you will identify and that many people have discovered over the time as well. So looking at a typical setup for uh, data warehouses and data lakes from like a very far distance will actually showcase us that it in the end boils down to a very simple setup where um, in the middle of the whole thing, you have some central storage component, be it some relational database management system as a backend of a data warehouse, or be it like some, let's say, bigger object store in uh, by one of the cloud providers um, that is the backend of your data lake. But in the end, you have like a central storage component, which on the one hand side um, is fed from many different sources. Um, where the data is actually collected and centrally archived. And on the other side, you have a lot of users uh, that are using some, some compute engines on top of the provided data uh, to make the best out of it. The interesting point is that um, this brings inherently some challenges uh, that when working in such a setup for a long time, many people have uh, in, in many different companies have realized. And the first thing is that um, you create quite a distance between the people that are actually using the data and between the people that are producing the data. Because you always have this big central entity, which is the one known point that people are working with. So for instance, I've been working in the data lake setup for the last five years, and to just give an example here, um, whenever a user, a typical user journey was looking like, um, I want to understand what is the data that I can use for my particular use case. So what I do is I go to the central data lake, I try to understand what's there, and I start using some of the data that has been centrally archived without ever talking to the original owner or producer of the data. On the other side, if you look at the producer's perspective of things, uh, you will find a lot of people that are um, producing data not even for the purpose of doing analytics of that data. You will have people that are, let's say, owners of microservices that are producing data for service-to-service -service communication. And just because this data for this communication purpose is, let's say, flowing through an event bus uh, that is company-wide used, and there is there happens to be a central data pipeline that is archiving everything that flows through this event bus, all of a sudden these things can show up uh, and be available for analytical purposes, even though they were never intended to be used that way. And what you see very frequently in such setups is on the one hand side, as I already mentioned, that you have a disconnection between the producers of the data uh, and the consumers that will ultimately be using this for, for analytical purposes. But also you will come or uh, you will arrive at the point that you have very unclear data ownership and responsibility. 
because the producer uh, in the scenario that I just described that was like eventually creating this data, sometimes they are not even aware that this data is stored in the central storage. So who will take the ownership and responsibility for the central storage uh, data that you actually have there that people start relying their analytical use cases on? And the second big part, um, which is creating a big problem with, with these, uh, with these uh, setups is that it doesn't scale very well. It scales very well on the technical side when it comes to, well, storing more data. I guess in a data lake in cloud object store, you have basically indefinite storage. Um, and it scales very well when it comes to scaling a processing engine, because you can just add new compute resources to that, and it works very well. But what you will very soon realize is um, sources need to be brought into your system. So like everything, if there's a new source that pops up, if like more and more and more sources pop up when your company is, is growing, each one of them needs an integration. Somebody needs to take care of this, which eventually ends up on the central team. But also on the other side, there are more and more users which are, as I said before, never talking to the actual owners of the data, but always jumping onto the central team when asking for support, uh, when they actually have some issues, which again, doesn't scale so well because you have more and more and more consumers and users over the time, but um, you cannot scale the central teams uh, at, an equal, uh, at an equal speed to actually catch up with what the users actually need, uh, bearing that you probably do not even want that because you know, growing and indefinitely growing a central team uh, is probably also not the right direction to go. Also, this is actually leading to the point that you actually give up a lot on quality because central quality control also doesn't scale very well because either it slows down everyone because everyone has to wait for central uh, quality insurance mechanisms uh, to take place or, and that's like the much more common case, the quality actually goes down. So to address all these things, um, there has been like a lot of discussions uh, over the last one to two years, I would say, uh, to talk about uh, this whole data mesh concept. And that's exactly what I would like to look into now and um, introduce at first uh, three of the main pillars um, of what the data mesh actually is. The first thing um, that, uh, that comes to mind is product thinking for data. Um, then we have domain-driven design applied to distributed data. And then we have platform thinking for data infrastructure. And these are exactly the things that I would like to, to dive a bit deeper into now, starting with the product thinking for data. So if you consider data as a product, um, the interesting perspective that I can give you is that a lot of the things that you can apply when you talk about data products are not new at all. We know in general how product thinking works when it comes to, for instance, developing software, when it comes to operating a microservice by a particular team um, that is talking to their users, that is trying to understand what the users actually need. Are they happy? Uh, do we need to evolve our product in a certain way? Um, and also things like, what is my market in general? Like, how can I advertise uh, the, the, the product that I'm actually working with? What we now would like to do is to apply the very same thing to data. In the scenario that I described at the beginning, there was data that was just archived by accident, lying around with no responsibility, and nobody wanted to take the ownership for that. But what we much rather would like to do is to have data that is produced as a product with conscious decision-making on how to take care of that. To make sure there is a contact point for when I want to work with a certain data product, to make sure that there is somebody that is actually proactively reaching out to the users of the data, that is even advertising the data product uh, to share with other people that there is something that could generate value for particular use cases. And this is exactly what we mean when we talk about data as a product, um, to make this shift and to make sure uh, that we consciously think about um, what data we want to share and that we actually provide the people to also take care of that. This often comes with um, positions like a data product manager or even dedicated data engineers that go into teams that have previously only been consisting of, let's say, backend engineers that were developing some microservices um, to really make those teams 
in, uh, turn those teams into cross-functional teams that take care of the full space of um, what they are actually responsible for. And this directly brings me to the next part, which is uh, domain-driven distributed architecture. Again, this is something that is not new to us when we talk about software development, when we talk about things like microservice setups, where you have teams that are responsible for a particular area, for particular functionalities um, that they offer um, when, it comes to, uh, when it comes to providing services um, and when it comes to, for instance, integrating a checkout page in the shop of your online shop or something like this. Right? Now we want to again take this and turn this also and apply it to data as well. We want to make sure that this team that has the expert knowledge for this particular domain that they are working in, for instance, the checkout, the checkout for the shop, to also be the ones that actually decide how to work with the data that they produce. Because after all, they are the domain experts. They are the ones that know best what are the things and how the things are actually meant to be used. Again, in the current setup, you very frequently have the central team who is providing you with the data, who has no idea what the content of the data is actually about, but it, still they are the ones that you reach out to when you have questions about, let's say some quality issues uh, that you observed uh, when working with this data in production. The interesting thing also about these domains is, um, and this is really where the, the idea of the mesh also kicks in is, um, there are domains that are more uh, what we call source aligned. Uh, they are like closer to the data when it is actually produced. Um, and they are like prepare the data in a certain way so that for the very raw data, very close to the source, uh, it turns it into something useful that people can build up on top. But there are also things like aggregated domains that build up on top of other domains and potentially even combine the input data from, uh, from multiple different uh, domains to turn it into something on a more higher level, to turn it into something more aggregated and to really like build up on top, uh, on top of the things that are already provided by others. And this is like really where, where this whole structure of like uh, having data products by the different domains and building up on top of this turns into this idea of the data mesh. Last but not least, I want to talk about the uh, self-service data infrastructure platform, um, which is the idea of this central infrastructure team that we already had before, but turning it away from the central responsibility for the data itself. So actually you want to go to this point that um, an infrastructure team provides technical capabilities. And that you as a user, as a domain expert, um, can use these technical uh, these technic, uh, capabilities to turn your, uh, your local application into a product that you want to share. This comes with simple things like providing infrastructure, like Spark platform, like um, Airflow for scheduling, like uh, a data catalog, like uh, some central storage, uh, similar to what, to what my team is doing right now. Um, to like offer these capabilities so that others can make use of them, but how in the end they will be using them, that's totally up to them. And to like show a little bit how these things uh, come together in the end, uh, there are some things uh, shown here as well uh, that came that come to the usage of such capabilities, where on the one hand side, you always need a platform support uh, to, to be able to do these things uh, on a global scale. But on the other hand, that also needs the input from the people that are actually working with this. So for instance, discoverability. Yeah? Discoverability always means that you need a platform capability that allows you to, let's say, have a central catalog where you can go and discover data sets. But it also needs the input from the domain team that actually provides the content um, to describe their data sets and to make them discoverable. Yeah? Same for addressability, you need to understand where to actually find these data sets. And of course, uh, very similar, they need to be self-describing. But then also in, in, in some other directions, you need to make sure that data sets are secure. They are governed by, global, by a global access control mechanism. And of course, the mechanism, the capability itself is again, something that should be centrally provided by an infrastructure team. But making use of it is again, totally on the side of the users. 
And uh, of course, uh, this also leads to the point that you can uh, create open standards to not on the one hand side, make sure that data sets can actually be trustworthy, but they can also be interoperable when it comes to um, combining them and working with them together. So after all, data mesh is much more of a mindset shift than it is like a, let's say, technical framework to, to apply to, to particular cases. And like we are really moving from like these cases of centralized ownership uh, to really decentralization of such topics. And we are no more talking so much about like pipelines as everything that matters and like having these big central pipelines that connect sources and make data available, but much rather we are talking about the domain data and about the, the different teams uh, and uh, domain experts that are actually taking care of that. We are becoming conscious about data. We are no longer just produ producing it as like some, some form of site garbage, but instead we are actually consciously turning data into a product. And we're moving much more away from these silo data engineering teams towards these cross-functional uh, domain data teams. And last but not least, we are moving away from the centralized data lakes and data warehouses uh, towards an ecosystem of data products. So just to uh, repeat once more to, to finish this part of the introduction, uh, data mesh is a combination of product thinking for data, uh, of domain-driven design applied to distributed data, but also platform thinking for data infrastructure. There's one part that I haven't mentioned yet, uh, and that is federated governance. Federated governance is like addressing a lot of the concerns that, uh, that people have when it comes to these, let's say, decentralization approaches to make sure that things do not completely drift apart. And this is something that I will go a little bit later into uh, when, I, uh, when I will guide you a bit more on the journey um, that, I, that I have drawn out, uh, where I will share some examples in this particular area as well. And just to repeat this once more, data mesh is not a detailed framework or solution to be implemented. So this is really key to understand that there is no single vendor XYZ that has developed the technical solution to apply a data mesh. Yeah, so there are, this is really about like making a conscious effort and like having a mindset shift on how to deal with data on an organizational scale. This so far for the introduction side, um, I hope uh, this uh, was, uh, uh, this allowed you to get like a little bit more of the context of the scope uh, that we are going into here. I can absolutely recommend to um, dive deeper into the topic uh, if you want to get more known about the basics. Uh, again, once more, the training that I'm also offering, uh, but also to dive deeper into the, the um, original articles by Jamak Bigani on martinfowler.com. Uh, were I think around two years ago, she wrote for the first time uh, about the data mesh topic in general, but there was also a great follow-up article in December last year uh, that even went deeper into the topic. So I can only recommend um, checking those out and following up if you want to learn more in detail. What I want to focus in on now is a little bit more of the practical approach to the whole thing. So I want to make uh, share with you some some understanding that I that I gathered over the time. Again, both from my personal experience, but also from talking to to many different people from 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 different companies, um, to understand like how can you now really apply apply these theories that we've just discussed and to turn them into into like some some practical things that you can. Uh, take in um, and draw some advice on for, for your setup and for your company. And what we have discovered um, while looking at all these different use cases that we got in touch with was that um, we can break down things um, in three big areas and like three, let's say, major steps that, uh, that companies um, are, are working in and are, are advancing forward. And the first part is, of course, the whole getting started. Uh, how do you make sure that you like um, spread the ideas um, and you really talk to, to like many different people within your company um, to, um, to yeah, create like a little bit of a base uh, of knowledge of people that are like trying to push into the same direction and to start fostering this mindset shift that I've described a little bit um, to have more people that are known, uh, that, that know about the part. 
of course, then this big second step is about actually trying to scale this. Uh, so how can I now actually, if I have gathered some allies, if I have like uh, some um, some ideas already of on, on how to introduce the topic to my company, how can I actually scale this to, to, to an organizational level? And then last but not least, uh, the topic that I already shortly touched on uh, regarding organizational alignment. Um, this is something where, for instance, the parts around like the federated governance that I've already talked about uh, come in as well. Getting started. So um, I already touched a little bit on the pain points of unclear data ownership. Uh, but one thing that I would like to do today is to also share a small story with you um, and make this like a little bit more livable to, so that you can understand where a lot of these pain points are coming from. Um, just a short disclaimer, this is not like an actual story. This is like a combination of uh, many different things that I've heard uh, uh, from different companies and also experienced myself. Uh, but of course, I'm like uh, telling it in a way uh, that you can understand a little bit better and feel the pain points there. So I'm a, I'm a data analyst. I'm new to the company. I'm new on a team um, that is actually tracking some KPIs about, uh, about some of the services that they are offering. And for the first time, this team is now in the position that um, they need to um, provide a KPI that cannot only be served by the data that is produced by the team itself, but that is also um, coming from another team um, and another service uh, that is producing some data which is outside of our control. So um, by the lead of the team, I was pointed towards a contact um, who should know something about this, uh, about this data that I'm actually looking for. And I'm reaching out to that contact, I'm reaching out to that team um, to understand how I can actually get my data. Takes a couple ping pongs, takes like a week in total or so until I finally get a response uh, from this team to uh, where they push back and they say, no, they're actually not responsible for the service. They, they don't, don't know anything about it. And uh, they have no idea about uh, what, I'm, uh, what is this content that I'm actually looking for. Um, took another week of ping pong to uh, also understand that they don't even know a direction to point me into. Uh, so basically I'm stuck. I don't know like how to continue in this particular situation. I'm asking around a bit with other people that are working with data and I learned that there's the central team that is working with data that is like providing this, this, uh, this uh, infrastructure platform. Right? So I reach out to them, I uh, talk to them, I sit down with, with one of the engineers who is then helping me to dig deep into all the data that they have stored and like based on the descriptions that I was providing them actually was able to help me find the data that I was looking for. Now they were also able to understand what was the service that was actually providing this data. And it turns out that the service that is actually creating this data is in fact owned by the team that I was already talking to. So again, I reach out to that team and um, to uh, provide them with the information and with the specific service uh, that uh, uh, seems to be very well in their control. And um, I get like a very shameful response that they are super sorry. Uh, but that there was one particular topic that one engineer from the team was always taking care of, um, who was responsible for that service, who recently left the company. So of course, there was like a lot of knowledge that got lost on the way. Um, this team um, was super sorry. They couldn't, uh, they didn't really know that this thing actually still existed. Um, and, um, but eventually I was able to find the data that I needed and I was able to set up the KPIs that I was looking into. And after all, like sitting with this engineer from the central team uh, was actually allowing me to solve the problem within 10 minutes. Um, but in total, I spent four weeks on actually getting this part done. This is just one of many stories to, uh, uh, for this particular situation um, that I, I'm fairly sure many of you uh, have like feel these kind of situations and have experienced similar situations before uh, when it really comes to, comes to working with data. A big part of um, now moving away, uh, like, like bettering the situation is to move closer to a data product centric mindset, mindset shift. If this team would have been aware of the data and if this team would have consciously offered this data as a data product, I would have never ran into the situation because there would have been a contact point, there would have been awareness and all that could have been avoided from the start. But how can I get there? How can I, how can I push that, right? Building up on top of the situation I just created, um, 
one of the nat most natural situations that I could have run into is I'm angry at that team and I start yelling at them because like they did some stupid stuff. They didn't get their stuff together. And um, now I'm like very, very angry um, because I it took me four weeks for something that I could have gotten done in 10 minutes. But what will that actually create? It will completely alienate these people from me. They will never ever want to work with me again. And whenever I now need to work with this team, because after all, they are producing something that I depend on, I probably have to go through like some senior management escalation to actually get something done. But what I much rather should try to do is to understand their perspective. Because on the one hand side, like they didn't do this on purpose. Yeah, they didn't try to fool me. They didn't try to actively try to harm me and make sure that I cannot deliver on my use case. No, absolutely not, rather the opposite. They are in a situation where they probably also have a lot of stuff that they need to deliver. They even lost an engineer, so the pressure on them is probably even higher on the stuff that they need to get done. And uh, then there was some knowledge that was simply lost. Like it, that was an honest mistake that when they told me they are not aware about this, um, that, uh, that this knowledge was actually simply not present. And understanding this perspective and trying to get some empathy with the other side of the table is really helping to like continue working together from the different parties that are actually involved here. The second big part to actually like better the situation is to create incentives. And this can happen like on, on very small scales, but this can of course also go uh, into very big directions. Just a very small thing. Now that I delivered my KPI, maybe I'm writing like a short blog post uh, internally to inform our users that I now have this new KPI that they can follow up on. So I'm basically informing a user group that there's a new feature that went live. Isn't it great if within that message, I also thank the team for the data that they actually providing. Yeah, sure, I have to jump my shadow to really like not uh, blame them for like everything that what happened. But after all, they are actually providing something that is useful for me. And thanking them might bring them into the position that they actually actively want to continue working with me. And like awareness is one of the key points uh, to actually drive these things forward. Because if I am now in the team that is actually producing data and I have never known that this was actually archived and people are depending on that. Well, now change this to the perspective where I am aware, where I know there are people that are using that, that are actually creating value from that. Simply having this awareness already creates a lot more incentives for me to, uh, to help that out. This can of course also go to a different scale. Now imagine that um, having this KPI in place now allows me to generate half a million in value for the product that my team is providing. But if that data would be available, let's say two hours earlier every day, I would be able to double that value. Now it's actually like the moment I arrive at this conclusion that I say, okay, there needs to be some engineering effort which will generate half a million in value per year. Now I have a very strong incentive to even convince the management of that team uh, to allow them to hire a new engineer. Because after all, if, if they add a new position to that team, I have clear numbers, black and white on the paper that showcase that this pays off. And this is again, like there's a different level of incentives, of course, um, but like being aware of the value that you're generating, being able to really document this and pinpoint these things down uh, can be huge uh, when it really comes to, to driving these things on an organizational level. Last but not least, start small. Don't try to like force something from the top on the full organization and expect everything to work out within a month. Start small, start with like some proof of concept teams that like um, that start working with you together uh, to adapt the mindset, to build a first data product and showcase that the things are working. Showcase that there's actually some value to it because this is like the direction that will then later on also allow you uh, to spread this and to start growing the approach throughout the company. And the moment you um, have enabled the first team, the first two, three teams maybe, and you can showcase that this is really working well, this is creating value for the company, uh, it will be much easier to then get the buy-in as well from everyone and to get more and more teams to start doing the same thing. 
which eventually will bring you to the second point that I want to dive into, which is scaling the mesh. Scaling the mesh, of course, again, starts with this very similar situation that we have, which is the pain points that we feel for the central teams. Uh, I have a very beloved example here um, where, again, I want to share a small story, um, where there is a team that is responsible for um, answering for access requests for data. So now uh, you have to imagine that there is this beautiful request, which is like half a page of text, which explains a particular use case and why a certain team needs access to a certain data set. Now this arrives as a, at a central infrastructure engineer who has the admin rights to execute a grant statement um, to actually give access to someone. But now all of a sudden this poor soul has to understand this use case and to make a decision if that actually makes sense uh, to get access to this data um, and to understand like what they actually want to do with this. And this of course includes considerations like security. Are they even allowed to access this data? But also content, does it even make sense to get access to the data? And now imagine this poor soul, which is probably a working student that is sitting somewhere deep in the corner uh, of one of these central infrastructure teams that has to answer dozens and dozens of these requests every day. That gets very cumbersome, that gets very painful. And um, this creates like a lot of, a lot of issues that, uh, that you need to address when, when actually trying to scale these approaches. Because falling into the trap of taking central responsibility about data doesn't even necessarily need to be just about the data. So you can have all the teams which are building beautiful data products, but then you have these challenges like the data access requests that I just mentioned, uh, which again can bring you into the position that everybody from all the sites, both the consumers and the users are always reaching out to you centrally. And again, I mentioned this a couple of times in the, uh, in the beginning, uh, you do not have explicit ownership. The person is answering the requests, has no idea what, the, what these particular use cases are actually about. You have no quality guarantees. They might just like push through a request which should have never ever been pushed through. If somebody would have actually had a look that knows the content of this use case and the content of the data. But most importantly, again, you bring yourself into the situation that the central team becomes the bottleneck. And this is again the part where you actually want to move away from that and do not want to provide central infrastructure um, that everybody is using and relying on you, but you really want to provide a data infrastructure platform. So you want to remove yourself from the central piece, centerpiece and you want to provide something that everybody can use, that you are building, that you are maintaining but they can use it by themselves. And again, I have like a great example. Uh, this is even from, from the context of, uh, of my current company where um, we were providing a piece of compute infrastructure to the rest of the company. This started with, at the beginning, a lot of people running their own Spark clusters because they needed to take care of their own machine learning use cases. And every day people were reinventing the wheel because there was yet another team that needed to operate their own Spark cluster. So the right call was, of course, to centralize this because we already had 50 teams which were doing the same job every day. And, but we said we didn't just centralize this and took over the work of these teams, but instead we centralized this in a way by providing an infrastructure platform. By now, we have a team of three people that is actually offering Spark clusters to more than 100 teams in the company. But how did we actually get there? So on the one hand side, um, we made sure that we are actually data agnostic, that we made sure that from the central perspective, we are providing you with the infrastructure in a very easy way, but you decide what to actually do with it. You are the one that is actually working out your use case and you are the one that is responsible for, for, um, for getting the stuff done that you need to focus on for the actual content of your use case. At the same time though, we took over the responsibility for operating the infrastructure for you, which, for this poor machine learning uh, engineer that was hired, that was promised to work like on a cool data science problem uh, and then spend 90% of his time just like trying to set up a Spark cluster. That is a huge relief because all of a sudden the Spark cluster is just running, they can use it and they can fully focus on the use case itself and become much more productive in that way. But what was also super important was um, to provide this in a self-service way. So like by now we just have a simple template that people fill um, that uh, there's just like one small approval step in between uh, to actually um, 
trigger a whole chain of automation that then takes care where the people already provide us all the information of what data do they need access to, who should be able to, uh, to, um, to use this cluster. Um, I don't know, how big should the cluster be? Do they need some additional libraries maybe for their particular use case? All these kind of things, they can just provide in a template and then at the end, somebody else just clicks a button uh, and all that stuff is, is happening automatically. And one other big point that is that is uh, that is so important to mention here is that this is actually leading to a standardization of tooling as well, because if it becomes so easy to um, to get a spot cluster, why should I start using all the different kind of engines that are out there on the market? At the mo at the beginning when we started, we had so many different tool teams that were using like Spark, Flink, I don't know, uh, Storm. Some of them had their own Cassandra's, Elastic searches, whatever people were using for actually were like working with their data, and like this, this is like a super easy approach to just by providing a convenient uh, data infrastructure platform solution, uh, you can also standardize the tooling that is actually used for these use cases. So um, when it goes to beyond uh, the, the part of just scaling the mesh, um, there always comes up the, the big question about, but what happens if all these things become decentralized? What happens if um, silos start to develop? What happens if I now come into the situation that I want to make use of two different data sets, uh, data products, I'm sorry, uh, that are offered by different uh, teams, by different uh, domain experts, and this, these are perfect data products. Yeah? They, they are like perfectly fine, uh, usable by their own, but there's completely no alignment between them. Yeah? They cover partially overlapping data. Let's say I need to have some user data from the one side, while I need to have some sales data from the other side, and I need to combine that to do some analysis. But there's no way of like combining these two data sets because there's no alignment between those different, uh, between those two domains. Uh, just because uh, they have never talked to each other. They just did their thing and they are completely drifting apart and becoming silos uh, of what they're actually working on. And this brings us into the direction of the, the decentralization challenges. We've been talking a lot about the centralization challenges at the beginning, but of course, when you start pushing for decentralization, this again brings different challenges that come, uh, that come with this shift as well that you need to address else you're just ending at the other extreme of the spectrum and you are having very similar problems nonetheless. And on the one hand side, we have, uh, we could potentially arrive at unaligned data products. I already mentioned two teams, one for user data, one for sales data, and they have like perfectly work out data products. They are taking on all the ownership. They are working with their users. But when I actually want to combine these two data sets, uh, it takes a lot of effort to actually make them uh, uh, being able to combine them. And missing interoperability is also something that I can have the perfectly worked out data set, data products uh, that I'm working with, but one is in the Redshift cluster that this team owns and the other one is S3, which I am analyzing with my Spark job. Well, now again, like there's no easy interoperability between, between those systems because each team is using their own solution after all, um, and they chose different technologies for their different use cases. And again, like all that is, is accumulating, of course, to, uh, to start creating more and more data silos uh, where these uh, were like things just exist by themselves uh, without this alignment process, which is overarching between the different teams. And this is now where it uh, is much more important to talk a bit more about the whole idea of federated governance. There was already like a lot of ideas around like governance in general, uh, also in previous data warehouse and data lake setups, which was mostly driven by trying to um, enforce certain standards um, that are centrally decided um, across the whole system that is uh, that it is applicable for. And of course, there's still like some of the ideas when it comes to, to talking about federated governance where it is about um, defining global standards. But the interesting thing here now is that on the one hand side, you are not just having a governance team that is defining the rules of play that everybody has to follow, but it is important that you actually bring the different representatives of all the groups to the same table. 
And this includes the different groups, the different uh, from the different domains. But this, of course, also includes the other groups that are that are that are playing along there as well. This might include some people from top management that just want to stir the general direction um, that the whole data ecosystem is moving into. But of course, this also uh, includes people as low level as the data infrastructure platform, because after all, based on the needs of the different uh, of the different domain teams. Um, this might drive what are new capabilities that the, that the infrastructure team should also uh, be working on. But the biggest part here is like these, these two directions of on the one hand side, uh, bringing all the people from the different groups to the same table, but to also ensure that there are certain decisions that don't need to be taken globally. There are again certain things that are local to a particular domain where like Again, we are speaking about this encapsulation behind the data products when it comes to some very specific details um, that the domain teams can very well decide by themselves because there is no overlap, there is no impact on other teams, um, and there is no need to have a global alignment because I can give a certain degree of freedom to these specific domain teams. But I also need to understand where, is, where to draw the line, so to speak. And of course, this is fine art, right? So this is like, like a very, very difficult act to really understand where to draw the line. And I also have to say, this is not something that many companies have figured out yet, right? Like many companies are still in much, in much earlier stages when it comes to introducing the, the data mesh idea in general um, to their company, but also when it comes to like setting up this whole infrastructure platform and trying to scale the mesh, there's not so many teams that yet had the chance to really work on these enhanced topics as well. Yeah. So, and that being said once more, it is a journey. Uh, everybody of us, uh, even though we are talking about experience and talking about different use cases uh, that we've already seen, um, Nobody has built the perfect world yet. Uh, and I'm sure like this will not even be existing in the future because it heavily depends, of course, on the specific setup on the specific company that you're working in um, to bring us into this position that um, we want to achieve this data mesh together. And that's of course also where I invite all of you to take part in these discussions, to become part of the community and to continue driving these discussions forwards together um, and to, of course, share your use cases, talk together, sit together, and make sure that the knowledge is spread and make sure that all these ideas are properly discussed between all the different people um, that are involved in similar projects in their companies. With that, I would like to hand it over to the Q&A part. Um, I put a nice little QR code here as well. And I also, um, but you can also directly go to slido.com uh, and introduce the uh, and uh, put in the code of DTC uh, for Data Talks Club, uh, and then you will get to the page where you can uh, see some uh, where you can ask some questions and also upload the questions of the others. Yes, and there is also the the link is pinned to in the live chat, so you can just click on that. Yeah, thanks, Max, a lot. It was uh, like a lot to, to unpack because for me, uh, I'm quite new to this. Uh, so for me, like it was certainly a lot of information. So thanks a lot for doing this, especially these stories. Uh, I could totally relate to that. I, I, I felt myself in this uh, in the shoes of this uh, poor analyst who needed to do this task. Uh, yeah, that was uh... so we have quite a few questions. Um, so the first one is a question from Pedro. Do you have any advice on reaching an agreement and appointing an owner in cases when there is isn't a clear owner in data assets? So the, the interesting question, of course, is um, this needs to be decided somewhere in between the people that are uh, that have an interest in this particular asset, right? So often, even if there's no clear owner, there's at least a producer. Um, the data is coming from somewhere. And uh, between the consumers and the producers, there needs to be some sort of alignment to, let's say, take some level of responsibility when it comes to working with these things, right? Even if it just comes from um, being aware that there are certain dependencies and not just implementing a breaking change uh, when I just want to change something, um, 
because my service is able to cope with that, but actually talking to the people before and being aware that there are users on top of that. But this is, of course, a problem that uh, a process that can take time, right? Because after all, it then also heavily depends on if there's enough value to maybe turn this asset into a proper data product, where it might make sense to even have a dedicated data product manager uh, that is very close to the team that is producing this data um, to make sure that uh, there is there are enough resources to take care of the needs uh, that the different users and consumers have. Right? But general advice, I would say um, at first, again, bring all bring everyone to the table, uh, create awareness on the producing side, and try to to uh, get the producer to uh, to a situation where they are more mindful uh, about the data that they are providing and they are aware because after all it's also a benefit for them um, if whenever they are for instance implementing some changes uh, they are not responsible for various kind of incidents that are uh, caused on the side of the downstream consumers okay thank you so another question we have from Yevgeny. Uh, so first of all, he thanks you for the presentation. So and I join him, of course. So the question is central data catalog. Could you recommend any interesting solutions or projects to have a look on? So I have to say this heavily depends on the company. I have seen a lot of companies that are building their own catalog um, that are like swearing on some self-built solution. Um, because they can tailor it exactly to the needs uh, of the company. Um, at Zalando, for instance, we are using Colibra as a vendor um, when it comes to uh, when it comes to having a, a company-wide data catalog. But there are plenty others out there um, that uh, that offer things like this as well, uh, which might not 100% cover exactly what you're needing. So you might need to like uh, tailor and tweak this a bit to exactly your needs. Uh, but there are plenty of solutions out there as well that can already point you in this direction. But I have also seen as many uh, companies to actually build their own solutions. Mm -hmm. So did you say Calibra? Yes, that is what we are using at Zalando. Okay. Did any other tools come to mind that maybe you evaluated at some point? Uh, I'm not source, a maybe. strong expert when, okay. uh, when it comes to... There was a big evaluation process that was lasting for some time. Um, but I was not involved directly into this, so uh, I do not know anymore what were the other candidates uh, that made it into the final evaluation. So uh, unfortunately, I don't have this okay. information at hand. Okay, thank you. So there is a question from Oliver. How to integrate data from domains owned by teams that have domain experts but do not have data engineers and have no, budgets, no, no budget to grow? Uh, and uh, Oliver is interested in short-term solutions. Um, somebody needs to provide engineering resources, <laughs> right? <laughs> so that's pretty clear. Like if you, if there is an engineering task, somebody needs to engineer that task, right? Somebody needs to work on that. If the team that is actually um, owning that data does not have engineering capabilities, then of course these capabilities need to come from a different team. Often this is coming from the direction of the people that actually have an interest in that. But like, imagine the worst case situation, um, you have a team that has an interest in the data that has no engineering capabilities, uh, capacity, sorry. And you have a team that is producing the data that also doesn't have any engineering cap uh, capacities, but there's a need to build a data pipeline. There's no possibility to get that done. Somewhere there needs to be some engineering uh, capacity to actually work on this task, right? What I can always recommend is, of course, to work together on these. We had plenty of uh, what we call inner source projects in the company as well, where people started to contribute to things um, that, um, that were also in the ownership of different teams. We had people that even like built, started building data pipelines for us as a central team, uh, even though they just had one particular use case, but still they actually started developing a central capability um, even though that went much beyond uh, what they were actually uh, having the need for. And of course, if it comes to short-term, somehow somebody needs to arrange this internally to make sure that, that, uh, that somebody can work on that. But do not let the short-term become the long-term. That's always the biggest, uh, the biggest challenge. If you agree on such a short-term plan, make sure you make agreements for the long-term plan as well. Make sure that 
okay, I need to fix something in the next three months and I am willing to actually contribute my engineering power to actually take care of that. But I want that other team to now get a new position so that they can start the hiring process so that maybe in three to six months, they would be able to actually take over the model over there. Okay, makes sense. Thank you. Um, a question from uh, another question from Yevgen is um, how the traditional approach with uh, data marts per uh, per domain like uh, per, for marketing for finance uh, how is this different from treating data as uh, product domain ownership so how is it different from um, you know, what you presented so I wouldn't even say it's so much different but it's an it's a different axis. So like when you're talking about data marts, you're talking about the how, while when we are talking about, uh, about the data mesh we are, uh, and data products, we are more talking about the what. So like it's, it's more about like focusing on the, the, the content of the data and making, uh, having people to make conscious decisions about these things. Uh, while of course a data mart can be the right, uh, the right way on how to implement it for one specific area. Uh, where you in the end have something that where you can like drill down into the data to have one specific area where that makes a lot of sense. Um, but this is more, I would even say a technical implementation detail, which works very well for certain use cases, but works also very certainly not for all use cases. And this is exactly the point where you need to draw the boundary between what is the technical, technical implementation detail uh, and what is the focus on the approach as a channel. Okay, so basically, this could be one of the implementations of that. For machine. for one of the use cases, this could be one of yes. the imp implementations. But of course, there might be another use case where yeah. this type of implementation is totally mm -hmm. not fitting at all. Okay. Uh, another question from Yevgen is how to overcome the case when multiple teams need to ingest the same data. It seems that uh, they have either to do it twice independently or create a new domain. So um, let me share one, one concept that we have introduced in, in my current company, uh, which I, I always find very interesting, uh, which is that on the one hand side, we have um, still historically, for historic reasons, this big data lake where a lot of data sets are centrally archived. But we also expanded on top of this concept to introduce something that we call uh, bring your own bucket, uh, which is based on the S3 buckets. Uh, we are mostly AWS based. Um, so that a certain team that is storing some data in an S3 bucket um, that they store by themselves um, can be shared with the central capabilities. So that you can make sure that this can be attached to the central governance processes when it comes to, let's say, act, act, um, uh, access control, uh, but also when it comes to being able to use the central Spark platform, for instance, that I mentioned earlier, uh, to already have access to all these different things. And this allows for the point that if I am archiving some data and somebody else has the need to archive the very same data, um, they can simply use the data that I have already archived. Of course, there can be corner cases where one team has like stronger um, um, uh, dependencies or like, let's say they need lower latency on the data than the other team needs. And then of course, like, again, you can start some, some sort of collaboration uh, where you maybe, maybe even the, the ownership of that part shifts uh, because then there's somebody that has a stronger, a stronger need for stronger guarantees. Um, but um, a lot of the times uh, we are in the position where if one team is already uh, like archiving this data and acting like an owner to, to the data product um, that is provided that way, um, that somebody else can uh, easily uh, reuse, uh, reuse uh, this data so that there's no need for, the, uh, for duplication. Yes, thank you. Do you have uh, time for a couple of more questions? Yes, I think I would have like a couple more minutes so that we can uh, run over. Yeah, actually, because there are 10 more questions. questions, I don't think, uh, I apologize, but I don't think we will be able to cover all of them. Uh, but let's try to cover at least a couple. If you can mm -hmm. be a bit shorter, maybe we can cover even well, I don't know, three. So um, how is data, data mesh different from having proper data govern, governance or control standards? Data governance is part of a data mesh. So the data mesh goes much beyond that. Data mesh is um, like 
this whole federated governance part that I was talking about at the end is just one of the pillars of the day of the, the, the data mesh paradigm, I would say. Because there's also all these other ideas about like treating data as a product in general, about like taking ownership, about making conscious decisions about the data, of making sure that the domain experts are the ones that are actually the ones um, that are responsible and that are transforming the data in a way, and that are the ones that are that are sharing the data and that are the contact points when it comes to working this data. And of course, also the whole idea of this data infrastructure platform, where you make sure you solve this the central bottleneck issue by providing infrastructure really in a data agnostic and in a self-service way uh, so that teams can start using it uh, independently from the infrastructure team that is actually providing that. All that is also part of the data mesh paradigm. And uh, that's why governance is only one of the pillars that we are actually looking into here. Thank you. We have a question from Pedro. How would you suggest managing data quality, especially on aggregated data products with multiple data dependencies? It's very interesting. Uh, one thing that we also have in place in my current company is um, we have curated data teams. So we have dedicated teams that are responsible for a particular area, let's say sales or customer activity data or something like this, or product data, um, that are responsible for, so to say, building the aggregation level that is the most useful for the rest of the company. They, of course, depend on a lot of different sources. They depend on a lot of different teams that are producing data, which again are different data products that are built by the, by the different teams. And, um, but they, again, can already rely on the quality that is uh, provided in the data products that these more source aligned um, uh, domains um, actually, uh, actually present. But they can also, uh, they are also the ones that then, of course, for the aggregation level, uh, again, have uh, as part of their responsibility um, to, to guarantee good data quality for the aggregated data products that they are, again, then offering to the rest of the company. Okay, thank you. Um, last question from Mariano. Are there any tools, frameworks that are already available on uh, tackling the responsibilities of the data infra? Um, the good answer is, of course, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, like, there are there are plenty of things that that are out there that can make things work, um, and that can enable like an easy way of um, of enabling, let's say, a self service infrastructure. Right? So what, what I mentioned before that we have the Spark infrastructure that we are using um, where we are providing Spark clusters for, uh, for more than 100 teams with a team that just has uh, actually three engineers, I think four by now, um, that are really like taking care for providing this. Um, we are customers of Databricks, for instance. So Databricks is also helping us a lot when it comes to managing these things centrally because they are one of the vendors that offers a platform that allows for central management of smart clusters. Right? And there are plenty others out there that allow for easier central management of particular parts of the infrastructure um, specific to the, to the technology that you are currently looking at. Yeah? So like for some cases for us, we are working closely with some vendors which, which make that much easier for us. Uh, and which like ease our lives and provide things that probably would have taken us years to build by ourselves. Um, for some that doesn't exist yet. Yeah, so some of the technologies, sometimes open source, sometimes closed source, uh, it is much harder to actually use these. So that's why I mentioned the, the typical, it depends. Um, but uh, for some, we had a very positive experience as well. I was working with some of the vendors um, that we have. Yeah, thank you. Um, I. I think we need to be wrapping up and I think you have one last slide. Uh, exactly. Right? I have one last slide prepared or, or uh, two. Is there are a questions uh, about, uh, I think, the second half of the slide. Yeah, but yeah, um, the floor is yours, please. Exactly. So the first thing I already mentioned that shortly in the beginning, uh, we are also looking for a senior data engineer ex exactly for my team at the moment. So if you want to become part of the data mesh journey at Zalando, 
um, to really start applying these things in practice and to shape the data infrastructure platform uh, that we are building in our company. Uh, feel free to check out uh, this job ad. I would be super happy to, to of course, uh, talk to you um, or to see your application also directly in this part. And the other thing, also shameless self-advertisement, um, if you want to dive deeper, um, I am also offering a training at O'Reilly um, together with uh, Arif Bida, um, uh, whom I've been uh, giving a couple of data mesh talks together before with as well. Um, the next iteration will actually happen on 26th of April, so I'm not even two weeks from now. I think like before the talk, we still had right around 50 uh, slots left. If you have an already subscription, then this training is completely for free. Uh, so feel free to, to sign up for that uh, and chime in. Just go to, to O'Reilly.com and search for data mesh and then you will already find the training. Yeah, thanks. Um, we still have quite a few questions unanswered and I was wondering if I could post them in Slack and if uh, you can find some time, I don't know, tomorrow maybe to drop by and uh, answer them. Yeah, I think like that would be possible. If, if it's not too many and doesn't look like it yet, um, I would be absolutely happy to <laughs> yeah, okay. uh, to follow up yeah, on that. Because, um, like, so yeah. maybe we can just, just mm -hmm. do that off. Yeah, just sorry that we weren't able to cover them. And thanks a lot for putting your questions in slide. Uh, but uh, we, yeah, uh, that's too many questions. But I see that there is a lot of interest in the topic. So thanks a lot, Max, Max for, for joining us today, for sharing your knowledge with us for sharing your experience and uh, for telling these stories and uh, yeah so maybe um the, like if people want to find you what is the best way to do this to maybe ask a follow-up question yeah so on the one hand side always feel free to reach out to me on linkedin uh, you can find me there as well um or connect to me on twitter as well uh where i'm called mcs1408 <laughs> um so i would um yeah i should have put this on the slide as well that's, yeah. that's <laughs> a good follow-up in the show notes yeah. okay thanks a lot i think that's all and uh, i wish everyone a great evening or day for those who are not in uh, uh in europe or night if you're somewhere in india so Thanks a lot, Max, again, and thanks, everyone, and see you on Friday when we will talk about data observability. Thanks a lot for having me. Bye-bye.